hit record. And hello to anyone who is watching this recording after the fact. We're really glad to know that you are. Let's begin with prayer. And maybe this is really good for you, Kim, today as you approach your procedure this afternoon. Let us pray. O God of peace, who has taught us that in returning in rest, we shall be saved. In quietness and confidence shall be our strength. By the might of your spirit, lift us, we pray, to your presence, where we may be still and know that you are God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 And I always take that to mean you are God and we are not. And that's a good thing. So um, this idea of trusting in God and returning in rest seems appropriate right now. So today, I believe we're moving on to Matthew 8. But before we do, just a couple of things. First of all, there will not be Bible study next Wednesday because it's Ash Wednesday and I will be doing Ashes to Go and I'm going to Brighton Gardens. So Marietta, I will see you on Wednesday and then I'm going to Wes and then I have a service. So I, I'm just going to be wearing roller skates with ashes in my hand. So um, come by and get ashes at some point and, uh, and we'll resume Bible study the following week, which I guess will be the first of March. Are you doing a regular service at 12 next yes. week? Uh, there are services at 12 and at seven. Oh, okay. And, Great. And both Eucharist with the imposition of ashes. So, and That's I'll right. put that out as a reminder to everyone, or if, if folks, I know some of you all, did the ashes to go with me last year, which is great. And I'll be out there. Hopefully it'll be a warm day like today. <laughs> and, uh, and I will be delighted to see folks as they come by. Okay, so um, I just wanna pick up with the last two verses from chapter seven, which we talked about last week, the conclusion of the Sermon on the Mount. And, you know, we've had, we heard the Beatitudes and then we heard teaching after teaching after teaching after saying and then that section wraps up with this sentence now when jesus had finished saying these words the crowds were astounded at his teaching for he taught them as one having authority and not as their scribes and as we pivot now and move into chapter eight and chapter nine um, Jesus is going to come down from the mountain and be out in the, you know, out in the world among the people. I just thought it would be helpful to pause for a second and ask ourselves, what does it mean to have authority? It's an open-ended question. What does it mean to have authority? Well, somehow it 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 means the person has um, an entitlement. To mm. tell other people what to do or what to believe, mm -hmm. where that entitlement comes from, that's a matter of the source of the authority. And but I think that's what it means. Mm -hmm. Great yeah. distinction. Excellent. And I, I see it means... a little bit as as the scribes more ferreting what's in Torah and things and authority. I. Here, I think of it as Jesus having something new, something different that he's bringing. Wonderful. Mm. And I think it means that he has credibility. Mm. That, that, you know, what he says is revered or respected or listened to. And that the, uh, the people who are hearing him respect what the basis on which he's making statements um they the scribes as as john says are, are doing the, the the dancing on the head of the pin analyses and um mm -hmm. jesus is just straight up saying this is true and somehow they either trust his ability to say so or trust the wherever whatever the source is that he has from of for this information it's uh i wonder about the root of author in there and i mean it it's it sounds like it's coming firsthand mm -hmm. um that that is not being translated as by the scribes going back to john's point mm -hmm. he is the author how about of some a, greek a, of something I was, clear 
<laughs> John, you read my mind. Excellent. I just so happened to have this pulled up. Um, it, yeah. Power of choice, liberty of doing as one pleases, physical and wow. mental power, Ooh. power of authority influence and of right and that's kind of, i think that's what i heard you saying mark privilege uh power of rule or government um yeah so there we go there we go so it's interesting that the way matthew crafts the story right he has this summary statement it's and it's at this pivotal moment moving from the sermon on the mount going down the mountain out into the world matthew makes the statement they regarded him as one having authority so as we move into chapter eight i think it's helpful to be thinking about you know how does jesus wear that authority right and and we know some folks wear authority really lightly and loosely and gently and others wield it like um, a, a, a big stick, right? A, a bludgeon. And so let's see how Jesus does it. Um, all right. So let's see. We've got several paragraphs, several sections. Why don't we do these first two together, these two paragraphs, because they kind of hang together. Uh, does anyone have anything by the way, left over from last week from the end of the Sermon on the Mount, or are we okay to move forward? Okay. 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 Who would like to read these two paragraphs for us? You just lost. I'll, I'll read them. Okay. Thank you. Okay. When Jesus had come down from the mountain, great crowds followed him. And there was a man with a skin disease who came to him and knelt before him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. He stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, be made clean. Immediately, his skin disease was cleansed. Then Jesus said to him, see that you say nothing to anyone, but go and show yourself to the priest and offer that gift that Moses commanded as testimony to them. When he entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, appealing to him and saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed in terrible distress. And he said to him, I will come and cure him. And the centurion answered, Lord, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof, but only speak the word and my servant will be healed. For I, also am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes. And to another, come, and he comes. And to my slave, do this, and the slave does it. When Jesus heard him, he was amazed and said to those who followed him, truly I tell you, in no, in no one in Israel have I found such faith. I tell you, many will come from east and west and take their places at the banquet with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, while the heirs of this kingdom will be thrown into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And Jesus said to the centurion, go, let it be done for you according to your faith. And the servant was healed in that hour. Thank you. So interesting juxtaposition of these healing stories. Oh, here comes Donna. I'll just welcome her. Welcome back, Fred. Oh, we can't hear you though. I don't know if you can hear us, but we cannot hear you. You're not unmuted apparently, but we still can't hear you. Hey, Donna, I don't know if you can hear us or not, but welcome. We're so glad you're here. Uh oh, Fred. Still not there, Fred. Is your volume up? Sometimes, of course, if your volume's not up, you're not going to hear me saying that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. It's Donna. Okay, so 
Ray has just read for us these first two paragraphs. And Donna, right before you um, clicked on, we were talking about what does it mean to have authority? Um, because at the end of chapter seven, Matthew sums up the teaching on the Sermon on the Mount and talks about how everyone's astounded by Jesus because he speaks as one having authority. And so we talked about authority. And now Ray has just read these two um, healing accounts back to back. And I wonder where you all want to go with them. There's some similarities. There's some differences. Well, I was a little confused. I, I was bemused by the all the, the huge range of definitions of authority, um, all of which seem to center on power and all the res all the other ones were authority over th authority, which seemed, um, you know, redundant or something. Um, so it didn't make a lot of sense. Um, but now here he's showing actual power, mm. and um, that I guess from that comes whatever we term authority. Mm -hmm. I mean, oh, he he actually can do that. Um, so therefore, he must know what he's talking about. Mm. I was struck by, I also am a man under authority. I guess referring yes. to Jesus as a man under authority. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but under authority versus having authority. That's, that's yeah. two different things. There's, there's a boss over him. Uh -huh. and there's a boss over the centurion and he's, he's sort of middle management. <laughs> <laughs> what does that say about Jesus? <laughs> What do you make of that line when the man with the skin disease, whom we usually take to be a leper, when he says, if you are willing, you can make me clean. How does he know this? Why does he assume that? Good question. Were you going Interesting. Uh, I'm I'm looking at these two, and I, this is a, a, for, a thought forming rather than a thought formed. But in the first case, he this uh, the the man approaches him and seems to have confidence, faith in Jesus, the the healer. In the second one, there's the the touch does not occur. Am I lying? It is a matter of it is yes, you are for it. It is a matter of the man's. It, it is a matter of the man's faith rather than touch or Jesus' touch that does it, and uh, I, I I don't know where to go with that. I wanted to make one point back before I went dead. You know, when Jesus, when he said he taught with authority, you know, there's almost a bit of uh, heresy in that. The scribes and you know the Pharisees went back to some somebody who had gotten his words directly from God. Mm -hmm. For Jesus to teach with authority means he is speaking for God. Mm -hmm. And you know that's that was a good way. You know there was a uh, a strong flavor of capital punishment for anybody who did that un unauthorized. Stay tuned. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah it only um, goes downhill from here exactly. yeah but i mean that's the uh you know by by teaching with authority <clears throat> there's a big difference between saying moses said mm -hmm. and i say to you mm -hmm. well that's isn't that exactly what sue vaughn was talking about on sunday when she quoted brian mclaren and said that, you know, that construction, you've heard it said, but I say to you, that's one of the most dangerous, um, you know, dangerous constructions, dangerous teachings for exactly that reason, right? And it upends things and it calls into question everything that's come before in Judaism. So great point. Now, I, I don't know if I, you mentioned it, there is in uh, some communities the thought that, you know, the centurion slave, the better Greek translation was boyfriend. Hmm. Hmm. 
Oh, let's, even more interesting. Yeah, let's. Well, see. that that would be you know, if Jesus is uh, is condoning that relationship. Well, I think the first radical thing there is the centurion is probably not a Jew. This is so Correct. reaching out into yeah. the Gentile community. I mean, that's let's go there also. <laughs> Well, and this is, I don't know if it's in Matthew when Jesus says, you know, when another Gentile comes and asks for healing and he says, you know, I've come only for Israel. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The Syrophoenician woman. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, is that, but, but did that occur before or after the centurion thing? Because it does seem inconsistent. Whereas I don't know if it's in Matthew or not. Oh, but the centurion is, is you know, clearly. The centurion is in Matthew, but I'm not sure if the uh, Phoenician woman is. The Syrophoenician woman, yeah. Um, also known as the Canaanite woman. Um, but oh, look at uh, back, Oh, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, in the case of the centurion, I mean, it's even more explicit at the end of that where he talks about the I assume the Jews who are heirs of the kingdom who are going to be thrown out, not all the Jews are going to make it. Mm -hmm. But the centurion has more faith than anyone else in Israel. Exactly. Uh, so it seems a very broad and opening uh, for those of faith who will who have great faith will be will enter the kingdom, will serve in the kingdom. Yeah, yeah, I feel There's like many. the first few verses of chapter eight, um, because Jesus is saying, tell no one um, that when people do decide to have faith in him, like this person, um, the centurion, that he is just going on what Jesus has has preached or, or what his authority is, um, because there are no testimonies, I guess to him at that point and it doesn't sound like he witnessed it because it sounds like he's in another location so he really is just trusting that jesus is there i mean that jesus can do this there were a lot of faith healers running around that area at the time mm -hmm. I, i've been told that the major distinction between jesus and the others was jesus didn't take payment mm. and he also had authority so, you know, he, he, just, well, he, just looked, he looked like he could do what, it, what he said. That, that whole sentence, see that you say nothing to anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the gift that Moses commanded as testimony to them. That there seems to me to be a lot of stuff packed into that. Um, what is, I have seen this interpreted as putting a kind of thumb in the eye of the priests who had a, a franchise on healing i don't know what offering the gift that moses commanded would be in this case and what? uh you know would he, so he, he would be the, the the healed person would be in the position of making the offering let's say it's a pigeon uh for a healing that was not done within official channels I think I thought we did this in Mark because there's a similar yeah. passage. And yeah. when we did that, we talked about that Moses prescribed, or at least the Jewish law prescribed, that if you had leprosy in order to be cleansed, you had to show up for the priest and they had to come yes. one day and then seven days later and that kind of stuff. And, and I think we did talk about Ray's point that this was, you know, I have cleansed you, go, you know, according to the the Jewish tradition, go show the priest that you are fully cleansed. So it what, happens what over you, and over again in Mark that, you know, he says, don't tell anybody, right? but do what is required to rejoin the community. So here's what, it, how Leviticus reads. So this is from Leviticus 14. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, this shall be the ritual for the leprous person at the time of his cleansing. He shall be brought to the priest. The priest shall go out of the camp and the priest shall make an examination. I'm glad I don't have to do that. If the disease is healed in the leprous person, the priest shall command that two living clean birds and cedar wood and crimson yarn and hyssop 
be brought for the one who is to be cleansed. The priest shall command that one of the birds be slaughtered over fresh water in an earthen vessel. He shall take the living bird with the cedar wood and the crimson yarn and the hyssop and dip them in the living bird in the blood of the bird that was slaughtered over the fresh water. He shall sprinkle it seven times upon the one who is to be cleansed of the leprous disease. Then he shall pronounce him clean and he shall let the living bird go into the open field. The one who is to be cleansed shall wash his clothes and shave off all his hair and bathe himself in water and he shall be clean. After that, he shall come into the camp, but shall live outside his tent seven days. To On the seventh day, he shall shave all of his hair, of his head, beard, eyebrows. He shall shave all his hair. Then he shall wash his clothes and bathe his body in water, and he shall be clean. So that's, that's to Ray's point about there's a lot compacted in that one. Yeah. All those nine verses are compacted into that one sentence. Aren't you tempted, Patty, instead of restarting the prayer ministry to, to go this route? <laughs> Excuse me, one. <laughs> I'm curious about why the red yarn. It was expensive. Well, I suppose the priests. Priests had a uh, yarn stuff. store down the block. Right. <laughs> there's still the question of you know why is why does he tell the leper not to tell on anyone oh maybe maybe because he knows that the leper would be would not be welcomed back into the um, into the community if he made the claim that he'd been cleansed before he had the actual, you know, the 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 rabies tag, the the you know, I'm the official <laughs> stamp of yeah. You know, cleanliness. I read says. another commentary on, you know, trying to explain it that said, you know, there isn't any real, or there isn't a great deal of, uh, you know, talk of Jesus in the contemporary histories, and that this was a way to explain why. You know, if he was doing all these miracles, he wasn't better known. So that sounds like somebody's trying to explain it after the fact. But yeah, that's what I'm wondering. I mean, it's kind of like the centurion. The centurion says, oh, no, I'm not worthy to have you come into my house. <laughs> but at the same time, if you're a Roman centurion and you're uh, going to the local faith healer. You know, that would also have have uh, undercut his credibility is perhaps. Well, that's true too. Mm -hmm. Somebody was talking a minute ago. I'm sorry I had to step away to give Fred Bentley a check. We're, we're paying for Elias's tuition, by the way. So this is great news. Oh, really? um, uh, somebody was talking about, you know, how, or I guess I asked the question, how would the leper no, when he says, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. And somebody was talking about, well, maybe he, he's going off of his teaching. Just a reminder that back in Matthew 4, so before he goes up the mount uh, for to pronounce the Beatitudes and everything, uh, at the end of Matthew 4, Matthew says, Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness among the people. So his fame spread throughout all Syria, and they brought to him all the sick, those who were afflicted with various diseases and pains, demoniacs, epileptics, and paralytics, and he cured them. And great crowds followed him from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and from beyond the Jordan. So that's another one of those summary statements that Matthew makes, you know, and so it's another transition saying, okay, you know, now word is starting to spread. So then Jesus has this um, interruption, this little, um, you know, interlude. He goes up the mountain and teaches for three chapters, and now he comes down again. So, you know, the leper clearly has been hearing what's going on, uh, but he's so definitive. If you're willing, you can do this. Right. Yeah, because he's seen how or heard that Jesus can do this kind of stuff. But that 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 connects to me in a, in a different thing. One of the things that, that Jesus taught in that little interlude 
uh, was the idea that people should be uh, and prophets should be judged by their actions, not by what they say. Mm -hmm. And so one of the ways he's trying to get some credibility for what he he's saying, which for you know for the content of his teaching, uh, is by uh, exercising his authority to cure people, exercising his power to cure people. That way, uh, people will be more inclined to believe his teachings because it has this this productive outcome. He can actually make a difference in people's lives. You can see the fruits of it. Yeah. What of what tradition is the leper? Mm. Probably. Don't know. I would assume he was one of the Jews. Uh, I would say so. Given yeah. that Jesus tells him to show himself to the priest and, and to follow this Levitical ritual as Moses commanded. <clears throat> the centurion's slave, son, boyfriend, however that gets translated, tradition? Roman. Okay, so we have this yeah, yeah. position. You of, could be a slave. I mean, the Roman might have a slave of any nationality. True. That's true. Yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, so we don't know so much about the slave, but we certainly know about the centurion. So we have this juxtaposition of Jewish tradition and outside Jewish tradition, Gentile. Um, and it's just interesting that they that Matthew chooses to put them back to back again. Did they happen that way? I don't know, but this is the way the story is crafted. Um, so, so Jesus says, see that you say nothing to anyone, as Fred said, you know, hearkening back to Matthew, to Mark, where that's, you know, he says that all the time. Um, but instead, go show yourself. And, um, but if he's going to go show himself to the priest, here's my question. What is he showing to the priest if he's already been cleansed? That he has been cleansed. Right. Yeah. Maybe he was a known leper. I mean, people, you know, would have would have known who he was. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He's he would been have cleansed. Had... Go ahead, Fred. No, he would have had to have acknowledged his leprosy. Mm -hmm. Uh you know. Before, before this, he would have been known throughout. You know, he had to have a clapper and you know all the Ben Hur type stuff. Clean, unclean. But what about so if he's showing himself to the priest? You know, in Leviticus, you show yourself to the priest so the priest can make an examination. Um, and then, so this is a different revelation to the priest. And, and offer the gift that Moses commanded. So interesting, is he still, is the leper still to do the whole bit with the, the living birds and the hyssop and the crimson yarn and all of that? Uh, uh, what do you make of that? Ellie can help me parse this, <laughs> but it, I go back to the last word there, to, uh, testimony to them. Them maybe is referring to the anyone and the, uh, the referent and by going through the ritual then he is accepted back into the community and they can see that it's official that it's real they being the the anybody's that are around him the anyone's that's but, something uh, i've never understood um and i'm going back and forth as them who everybody on the block or them the crowd of priests at the at the temple but well, why yeah. to one priest yeah. so that that's i've never been sure about that phrase it's not something oh didn't oh. one something somebody say something um here about it being a poke in the eye to the priest yeah it's like mm -hmm. in it's kind of like a subtle sort of ironic thing you know go show yourself and the priest is going to know that there's somebody out there who can really, um, really heal without all this rigmarole about the, the, the yarn and the hyssop and all that. 
mess, you know, all these <laughs> turn around three times and cross your heart and whatever. Sit at the new moon, yeah. 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 There had um, been healing. I mean, you know, the reason they had this process is that there had been healings in the past enough to that they put this process in. Mm. And, you know, Elijah healed the uh, whoever that was, you know, came up and told him to go wash seven times in the stream. And he complained that he had streams in his own land. <laughs> <clears throat> but, you know, there was a healings were frequent enough, I think, that this would not have been considered, you know, anything that terribly abnormal because if it had been then they if it had been that rare they wouldn't have had to have had a process for it well uh, and I, I wonder also fred uh i mean this what we referred to here is the and what patty read out of was it leviticus it was, the, yeah. is, is a cleansing ritual after healing the is there a healing ritual that would have preceded this and i've heard it said whether it would with authority or not, that the uh, but the, the the priest had something of a monopoly on the healing trade, mm -hmm. and so that they would be put in the position here, if that is true, which I can't attest to, they would be put in the position of having to certify healing done by somebody else outside the system. Mm -hmm. Well, it sounded like happy. what from Patty read is that that's a pretty good check on whether the healing took or not. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, day after day after day, washing after washing, get all the yep. hair off. Now we can yep. see if there are any sores left. Yep. Exactly. That sounds right. It's like when my boys had lice and we had to shake their heads. You know? <laughs> 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 um, <laughs> just, you know, the, the people were asking, I think it was you, Ray, who was asking about the antecedent for the them. Of course, Amy Jill Levine says that the them is the priests. Um, okay, but and she yeah. speaks with authority. <laughs> she does, yeah, way more than I do. Um, so interesting, you know. Okay, so is this look? We I got healed somewhere else by this other guy. Um, just it's interesting in the cleansing and the healing. Are they the same thing? Um. They, these are just really interesting questions, I think. Um, I I have a thought here. Um, this kind of reminds me of Jesus' meeting with the devil and mm -hmm. the devil tempting him about throwing yourself off the building and turning the uh, stones into bread. And that would be a real flashy thing to do. Mm -hmm. And then everybody would be following you around. And that... He tells the member of the Jewish community not to tell anybody because he doesn't want to seem like a show off and like a person who is um, um, flaunting his power above the priest, but he still wants to give a little dig to the priest. <laughs> but with the, with the Roman, the Roman obviously isn't a Jew. He's not a member of the community. So it it doesn't really matter. He probably isn't going to tell anybody anyway because mm -hmm. he would get in a lot of trouble. Well, no, they were, he as I said, they were healers all through. And this was a, yeah, this was an area that was not exclusively Jewish. There were healers, you know, for other nationalities, other ethnic groups. So, and Jesus, if he's, if you're trying to recruit followers, you want people to know you have the power. You know, you don't hide your light under a bushel. I'm telling I'm him to sitting, tell no one seems to be like hiding your light under a bushel. I'm sitting here with the gospel parallels Yay. just to throw mm -hmm. in, and <laughs> they all have the exact same story, tell no one. Mm -hmm. Mark then says, the guy went out and told everybody. <laughs> Jesus couldn't even go into the town. He couldn't go in. He had to go out in the country and the people came to him. Luke says, despite having said, don't say anything, but now more than ever, word about Jesus spread abroad. Many crowds came. 
he had to withdraw to the desert to pray and uh, have some peace. So the word got out. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> Maybe this was a little clever reverse psychology on Jesus. Part. <laughs> I don't think it'd be necessary. He's just, I know humans. Okay. They're going to go out and brag. So, well, or, you know, I'm going to say, uh, Bill, what happened to your lep leprosy? You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You're going to say that particularly before you let him into your house. Exactly. <laughs> I think I've, I've told you before, maybe I haven't at, at Randy's former church in New York, there was this wonderful woman. Everyone loved her. She's a blessed memory now. Um, and she was an incredible gossip. And, and you just knew that about Mildred. And so the thing was, if you wanted word to get out, you would say to Mildred, don't tell anybody this. And she was so excited to have the secret. She immediately went out. So Randy got really judicious about how he messaged to her. It's like, okay, Mildred, you know, this is just between us. Please don't say anything. <laughs> Boom. Yeah. <laughs> Every community has one like that. The the the, the you could say that you know, it's just same story, just change the name for exactly. For, there's a person at, out at, at Holton. You know, <laughs> no, just, if you want everybody to know something, tell so and so, and tell her not to tell anyone. Exactly, <laughs> isn't that human nature? It's just it's, it's funny how that works. So we have some Roman Catholics in our midst this morning. Um, does, does anyone resonate with this line? I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof, but only speak the word and my servant will be healed. Do you remember that line? I seem to remember it as um, not my servant will be healed, but my soul will be healed. Yeah. And spoken right before receiving communion. Lord, exactly. I'm not worthy to receive you, but only say the word and I shall be healed. Yeah. It was Isn't even the same word of under my roof. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So we isn't that isn't that part of the confession though? And even even for the Episcopalians, you know, we're we're not worried worthy so much to, as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but thou art the same, you know. Yes, mm -hmm. that wonderful the prayer of humble access, which tweaks so many people. I love that prayer because mm -hmm. um, <laughs> we're not worthy in and of ourselves, right? Um, and thou art the same Lord whose property is it always, always to have, have mercy, mercy, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, oh, anything else about these but two points? Go ahead, Fred. The, you know, the preceding, you know, Jesus is threatening people that God isn't going to have mercy. If you don't measure up, if you judge, if you, you know, he is, he has been saying God is not going to have mercy on you. Well, I mean, there was a connection that I saw that maybe people want to talk about between that idea that God won't have mercy and this line later on where Jesus says, the heirs of the kingdom will be thrown into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I mean, the first part of that sentence is pretty good. It's inclusive. Mm -hmm. People will come from the, in the West and they'll be at the banquet. That's pretty good. Wow. <laughs> The other guys, you know, the ones who <laughs> look like they would uh, be part of the banquet, they get kicked out. And it's not a very nice thing to be saying about uh, the Jews who retain their Jewish identity. So I, I thought this was a little bit troublesome. Mm -hmm. Good. What do you all make of that? I, that you all it, it has echoes of the invitation to the wedding feast mm -hmm. of people who are uh, left out. Mm -hmm. uh, for for one reason or another, mm -hmm. uh, I I read that verse twelve be thrown into the outer darkness, weeping and gnashing of teeth is maybe something as simple as saying, you know, at the end of your life you're going to realize you missed it. Mm -hmm. Here it was before you; you had your chance and you didn't take it. But I, that's my very secular mind working. I'm mean, very I'm, human mind, but but <laughs> um, isn't there a through line that you can draw from the Old Testament um, to the Jews being the chosen people and considering yes. themselves to the New Testament? Many are called, few are chosen. Mm -hmm. There's choosing and rejecting and other points in the Gospels. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. 
I was interested, that's an excellent point. I was interested in the verb thrown into the outer darkness. You know, oh. it doesn't, Matthew doesn't say, or G, Matthew doesn't have Jesus say, they'll find themselves, they'll stumble into, they'll be thrown into. And I thought this was the Greek word, ekbalo. And it's, you know, it's driving out. So I think it's the same word for, you know, Jesus driving the money changers out of the temple and the spirit, you know, pushing, compelling Jesus to go into the wilderness. Um, so, you know, and that passive voice, you, you will be thrown out or they will be thrown out. Um, it sounds pretty harsh. Mm -hmm. And remember, and we talked about this a little bit before, is that Matthew's gospel is really interested in um, ordering the community. Mm -hmm. And so who, you know, who is following the teaching of Jesus? Who is, who, who is going to be part of that community and who isn't? And it's a pretty rigorous standard in Matthew. Um, and you know, John's gospel is so different because John's hang up is that they were thrown out of the synagogue. And so he's always, you know, he's got this ax to grind about that. But here in Matthew, it's like, okay, be careful. Um, you're going to find yourselves on the outside of this community. And then there's this eschatological, this end time overlay thinking about, you know, it, it, you know yeah. At the end of your life, at the end of days, you're going to find yourselves in outer darkness. So there's definitely insider, outsider. And, and Mark's point about that's the same sentence, right? Starts at verse 11, and then it pivots at 12. Very inclusive, lovely, lovely, lovely. And then you've got wild, the heirs of the kingdom. So it's it's very harsh. So. Uh, it, it sounds harsh. And but forever. The... <laughs> <laughs> it, it seems to me that, that what we're what 12 says is okay all of these folks from east and west and the people who get it are going to be in that heavenly kingdom mm -hmm. your punishment is you don't get it mm -hmm. you aren't part of the heavenly kingdom and uh, you can conjure up hellfire if you want all of this cultural stuff yeah but the punishment is not being part of the heavenly kingdom primarily in the first instance. But I think, too, the, the contrast is this is a centurion who is not a Jew. Exactly. He is not an heir of the kingdom. Exactly. And he's got great faith. And let me tell you, Jews who are not getting it, that you're going to be sorry. Yep. Yeah. But you can do, you can get it just like he got it because he's going to yep. come. Yeah. Excellent. And yeah, and it's not inherent. It's not saying that. And I'm reminded of in Luke's gospel, you'll probably remember that scene with John the Baptist, when he talks about even now, the axe is lying at the root of the tree and God can raise up uh, heirs to Abraham from these stones. You know, in other words, don't rest on your laurels, guys. You think that you're, to, to Donna's point, you think that you are the chosen people and you might lose your seat at the table if you don't wake up and you know have begin to develop this faith so you know the to what extent should we uh look at matthew's the the author's <clears throat> intent on you know making jesus a legitimate heir to the jew to the jewish tradition and you know <clears throat> you have to you have to upgrade to monotheism or to judaism 2.0 you know or you are going to find yourself unable to run all the great programs your graphics card won't work <laughs> it's a clumsy a good metaphor for a, for a certain audience <laughs> we were just saying we're all technologically incompetent before we discussion started so well you know, but I mean, here is here is Matthew who is trying very hard to uh, to get Jesus accepted as as the you know direct fulfillment of Jewish law, mm -hmm. and so he is telling you know some of these threats may well be to to Jews. You bet you have to come along, or you're going to lose your seat. You know, well, you've done everything up until now, but you you say you have to move forward. It's or, isn't it interesting? 
interesting though that it that those who are consider themselves in the kingdom by virtue of birth or genetics let's call it uh you know have are have not had to make a faith statement to be part of the heir of the kingdom they have not had to do anything they follow the rituals perhaps and he's he's going he's trumping all of that he's saying it ain't genetic mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. it has to do with the, the, the who you are and what you do what you what you trust mm-hmm. wow we get salvation the old-fashioned way we earn it well i mean it, it's it's the white supremacist <laughs> argument in a way here i am uh, I, I am part of the kingdom because uh, here because i am white i have a p- position i have privilege uh, i don't have to worry and that's nonsense uh, as we know uh we think we know uh well, and sometimes not nonsense. We even feel it. when that police car light flashes behind you yeah. there's a whole different reaction if you're black or absolutely versus white yeah, but I, it, I, it's, I think it's the same human dynamic. Uh, the, you know, we just, you know, how do you see it in our own time? That's my, all, my question all, too often, probably. <coughs> we want to uh, read these next two paragraphs. Should we press on? We've got a little bit of time left. Or do we... Sure. Do we there more to say oh, about yeah. okay so would somebody like to read these two which also hold together i think i'll i'll be happy to do that patty thanks john when jesus entered peter's house he saw his mother-in-law lying in bed with a fever he touched her hand and the fever left her and she got up and began to serve him that evening They brought to him many who were possessed by demons, and he cast out the spirits with a word and cured all who were sick. This was to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet Isaiah. He took our infirmities and bore our diseases. Now when Jesus saw great crowds around him, he gave orders to go over to the other side. The scribe then approached him and said, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Another of his disciples said to him, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, Follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. Thank you. So what do you hear? What do you want to look at in these couple of paragraphs? Does anything intrigue you, worry you, interest you? Well, 18 to 22 is, maybe Matthew just grouped them together, but these are two very gnomic, mysterious, Mm -hmm. non sequiturs that he's coming up with. And so you sort of, pack them together and then, you know, <laughs> puzzle over them for the rest of your life or say, oh, skip that. I can't get that. And keep yeah. Well, okay. So if we're going to, let's focus on that paragraph. So, you know, we've talked before about the process, which, you know, still is somewhat I'm mysterious. Sure. Oh, hush, Siri. Um, We've talked about the process, which is still somewhat mysterious, of how the Gospels were written down and the material that was knit together and how you know each one takes a different tack. So Matthew chose, for whatever reason, to put these non sequiturs together. And since that time, since the Gospel was written and when it was accepted as canon, it has, the Gospel itself has been authoritative for followers of Jesus ever since. So when we see this paragraph, and we're so lucky that we have the little gloss from the NRSB, would be followers of Jesus. What does that say to us in our time? You know, this this oddly constructed paragraph 
st still is part of our canon. It's still part of the authoritative scripture. So what does it say to us? What does it mean, you know, let the dead bury their own dead, for example? Let the past be the past. Hmm. Don't get trapped or, into the, the the requirements of custom. Which have, is, uh, oh, go ahead, well, please. I just say, or following me is more important than mm -hmm. you know. Set your life forward. Follow me. Uh, proclaim the kingdom. That you know. That's what you need to do if you want to. Don't worry about past being past. I mean, there's other references to. Uh, splitting from family mm. uh, and by extension probably from village and uh you know and considering them being dead to each other in uh in that sense you can That's... only have one primary goal and it really is the problem for you know a great many people in spiritual traditions is that you're called upon to give up everything else in pursuit of one thing. Mm -hmm. And most of us, if you're going to have a family, a job, you know, relationships, you have to keep a lot of balls in the air. Good. Eddie, okay. what about the foxes and the birds? Yeah. I, does, does Amy Jolabine have any <laughs> help with that? Or, or does any, anybody, anybody in this call have help with that? I, I am stumped. Let's see. We are again. Yeah, that's the whole theme of you're leaving everything behind if you follow me. Mm -hmm. And there's no certainty. You sleep where you sleep. And that that reflects the advice he gave the disciples when he sent them out. Yeah. Amy Jill Levine has no <laughs> no wisdom on. <laughs> She has a note about the scribes, but not about the foxes in the holes. Um, you know, and I do think it's sort of meant to be a warning, like, okay, you say you're going to follow me wherever I go, but, you know, I'm not staying at the Hampton Inn, and, you know, this is, I'm out there, and I do think that's part of, you know, this message. I guess, I guess that's the theme of this This paragraph is that you need to be willing to give up your present life completely and go on into a completely unknown yeah which again to fred's point you know yeah if the sons of zebedee left him in the boat well great but my kids would have some things to say if i left them at the kitchen table and just didn't come back with dinner you know so <laughs> Yeah, they can door dash, but you know. Um, as long as you leave your credit card, they'll be fine. <laughs> well, that's part of the principle too. You're, you're out there completely un unstrung, disconnected from your past. So no Apple that, Pay, you know, exactly. That's one of the differences in some religions. You know, in Judaism, before you take up studying the Torah full time, you know, they want you to be married and have the rest of your life settled. And I think I've heard in Hinduism, you know, before you leave everything, you should have built a house, had a child, had a son and planted a tree. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, you know, many other traditions, you know, say, you know, family, particularly the Christian tradition, you know, family is nothing but a distraction for getting into heaven. Well... Go for it, Ray. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, you, that was a slow pitch over the plate. Uh, it, it Turning it just a little inside out. I mean, we're all in the situation of trying to be followers. Uh, and there is plenty of uncertainty in life, as most of us have experienced it, uh, to, you know, to meet whatever the requirements of this scripture are. Uh, it seems to me you can, you must pursue. And if, even as you go about raising that family, paying that mortgage, uh, doing whatever constructive things uh, that your your work or your skills provide, uh, 
in this world. And it doesn't seem to me to be a, it's stated as a black and white almost, but in fact, we all live in the gray and they all lived in the gray. Yeah, it, it may be that that Jesus is directing this message not on to all Christians, but to a subset of them, the ones who have special responsibilities to uh, to spread the good word and build the kingdom and make it happen. Uh, and so I'm, I'm reminded of this great Caravaggio picture in a church in Rome where it's where Matthew himself is summoned. And there's Jesus at the door, right? And he's stretching out his finger like this, right? Pointing right at him. And there's Matthew saying, me? You mean me, Lord? And, and he, he's, he's sort of among the money changers. That was his life and his job at the time. And he, uh, the other people continue to count the money. They, they know where they're staying. But he's being told that he has to extract himself from that life and go on and do something special for Jesus. Uh, but I don't think that's what Jesus is, is saying is the, the condition for everybody. Not everybody has to make that special commitment to spreading the word of God. Uh, and so I don't think it's something that we have to say to ourselves, if I'm going to be a good Christian, I can't have a family, I can't have a normal life, and so on. But I do think it is a warning to the people who who want to who want to be special leaders uh, of the church that they're going to be called upon to, you know, have a rough life. Mm -hmm. That uh, Jesus's really... family, oh, Jesus's family came to him, you know, at the party and said, you know, your family would like you to come out. He said, "Who is my family? I don't know these people. You know, my family are the people who are who are following me." Yep, and, and then think about Jesus from the cross at the end of John's gospel, where he brings the beloved disciple and Mary together, and he says, woman, behold your son, and and he provides for this new family based on mm. her faith in him. Uh, so, yeah, but that, Mark, I just think that was incredibly helpful, what you said, and, and I know that you know, I've, I've seen it in Rome myself and I will find an image and send it out to you all. That's perfect. You know, and, and Matthew's saying, you talking to me, uh, I know exactly what you mean. Um, and that, you know, many are called, but few are chosen. And there's that particular call that Jesus has for those who would be his followers. Um, just, uh, you know, when we were talking Fred said earlier about how some of this teaching of Jesus, especially the authority piece, would be considered heresy. And, and think about in a Jewish context, you know, what's the most important thing is to bury the dead and the reverent and timely burial of the of family, you know, and honoring mother and father, a lot of it has to do with providing for them. So for Jesus to say, let the dead bury their own dead, whoa, you know, and again, you know, Matthew is, is writing, editing for a predominantly Jewish audience. And as Fred reminded us, you know, demonstrating that Jesus is the fulfillment. This is inflammatory right here. Um, and then there's no further explanation the way we receive it in Matthew. You know, then Jesus goes on to the next thing. But it's just like he's dropping grenades wherever he goes and just keeps going. Well, and burying the dead also. You know, most funerals have a lot of life and what happened in the life. And, mm -hmm. you know, it just is a, uh, it's practically, you know, an invitation for, you know, resentment i mean you look at the is you know the muslim funerals that are quite often spark riots mm. you know they you know he, yeah, i think jesus is saying just mm. leave it all you know leave whatever it is whatever baggage you have behind and move forward mm. what they say about irish funerals fred you know they have the corpse but the grudge lives on <laughs> I thought by the end of an Irish funeral, no one could remember even who was who oh, they the, were buried. The no, no, the grudge is, is, <laughs> is what is immortal. <laughs> Amen to that. Oh, gosh. 
All right, any last words? So I think this is a great place to stop. So in two weeks, we'll pick up with the storm, which is a great story. Um, oh, and then, yeah, the swine. So that, we'll have plenty to talk about on March 1st. Um, any last words about this before we quit? All right, well, thank Thanks. you all. Thanks. And Mark, I am gonna send out that image to folks just in case you don't know it. It is a great. wonderful painting. I'm so glad you Good. thought um, and I'll see some of you this weekend. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks, Bye. Patty. Thank you, Patty. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you everybody. everybody. Bye. Bye. Oh, you all. Bye, Mary. <laughs> Chuck and Jackie. Good luck. Blessings. Thank and you. Call me if you need me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> all right. Bye.